see nothing in front of me. Can't see nothing coming. Born and raised in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, in those days, very gentrified town now. In those days, just a poor mill town. My father was an electrician, grew up in a classic middle-class home. Um, after graduating high school, I, I, I went to Providence College. I was planning to get my master's degree in business. I can't sit behind a desk. So because I was in Washington, I decided I'd go out and interview with the FBI, Secret Service, and DEA predecessor at that time. Uh, and I'll never forget saying, you know, I think I'd really like to go with DEA because those guys seem crazy. I was a street agent and a supervisor with DEA for about 17 years. And then one day I was at my sister's house who, um, on 4th of July, and the director of DEA called me up and said, Bob, you're doing a hell of a job. We're going to move you. you got a choice of agent in charge of either Miami or New York. When I was transferred to New York as agent in charge, it began probably the most exciting piece of my life. Uh, this city, if you're in drug enforcement, is clearly the most exciting city in the world. Well, I was in New York about three weeks and my life changed. An agent, one of my senior supervisors, walked in and he said, boss, we've been file finding vials of this shit all over Harlem and they call it crack and we don't know anything about it. In September, almost no one in New York ever heard of crack. Did you bring some? Yes, I did. Let me see it. Can I trust you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> One evening, I got a call from my deputy, Kevin Gallagher. About 11.30 at night, I was in bed, and I'll never forget his words. He said, Bob, this is Kevin. Everett Hatcher has been shot dead. He was shot working undercover, assassinated from behind. Well, what happened, we found out later, was Gus Faraci became suspicious of Everett Hatcher. He simply walked up behind him, put four bullets in his head. That night, I did a press conference. Everybody who thinks doing a line of coke is a joke and doesn't hurt anybody ought to take a look at the body of this family man who has four kids and died trying to deal with those lines of coke that so many New York yuppies think is nothing. And apparently the president saw it, President Bush, and he was moved by it and he called me and said he would like to come up to New York and visit with the widow of Everett Hatcher and his in the DEA agent. Ladies and gentlemen, our commander in chief, the president, George Bush. Thank you all. Finally, I had enough. And one morning I called my deputy at six o'clock in the morning and said, Kevin, I'm going to go see John Gotti. And nobody else could know about it because it violated every rule in the book. He said, you sure you want to do this? I said, yeah, but if I don't come back, at least you know where I am. I went up to Howard Beach and I knocked on John Gotti's door. He came down and it was amazing to me, 6.30 in the morning, his hair was combed and he was wearing a bathrobe that probably cost more money than my suit. And he said, what can I do for you? I said, John, you know our guy was killed and you know Gus did it. He said, yes, and I'm sorry for that. I said, John, I need him handed over to me or your business is stopped. Do you understand, John? He said, yes, I understand, thank you very much. And we each turned around and walked away. 17 days later, I got a call from one of our agents, and he said, Bob, I think we got uh, Gus Faraci. Uh, Gus Faraci was laying on the street corner in Brooklyn with 17 bullet holes in him. That was the end of Gus. Some of the New York papers said I was a hero. Some said, who was I to play judge and jury? But I was never going to allow a DEA agent to be assassinated and the person who did it get away with it.
I was born and grew up in a small town in Illinois, a university town called Champaign-Urbana. At that time, I was being raised in the Lutheran faith and was going to Saturday school and Sunday school. And I got to talk to the pastor one day and I asked him what was going to happen to all the Jews and the Buddhists and the people in Africa. And he told me they were all going to hell. I went home and I told my parents I wouldn't go back to that church anymore because in my heart I could not believe what that guy was saying. entered Urbana High School in 1966 at the age of 15. After I um, kind of lost faith in Christianity, I was looking for something and I was reading all these books, books by Jack Kerouac and Ken Kesey, and I think the most important book was probably Tom Wolfe's account of Ken Kesey uh, and the Merry Pranksters. I ended up going to San Francisco, and, and LSD was unheard of in Champaign-Urbana. So me and my friends, we became the first people in our high school to actually take LSD and smoke marijuana. created my own underground newspaper called the Tin Whistle, which just got bigger and bigger every month till it was being distributed in four high schools in my area, and it was banned in every single one of them. I ended up reading the first book about the Kennedy assassination. It was called Rush to Judgment. And after reading that book, I pretty much concluded that the CIA was involved somehow in the assassination. And I became a Hamlet figure and spent the next 30 years trying to figure out who was really running the country. I was working as a reporter for the New York Daily News when I started covering the uh, art scene. I really didn't know anything about graffiti. I wasn't a native New Yorker. I didn't know the history of it or anything. I'd been through this whole underground, hippie, beatnik, psychedelic movement with garage rock and we were doing our own publications and our own bands and making up our own culture. Well, at the same time, uh, inner city blacks in the South Bronx were doing a very similar thing. After I got hired by High Times, the first big story I did was to go to Amsterdam to interview the founder of the Seed Bank, a man named Neville who had created a multi-million dollar operation by shipping high quality cannabis seeds around the world. While I was out there working on the story, I ran into some Americans who told me about the harvest festivals that had been held in Northern California in the early 70s. And it gave me the idea of trying to have a similar harvest festival in Amsterdam, legally, where we could establish a worldwide standard for cannabis. I didn't know very much about marijuana when I came to High Times. It was only after I read Jack Herrera's book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, that I got a sense of the uh, tremendous political and spiritual implications that the plant carried with it. And I think it was the knowledge of the environmental benefits of hemp that really helped drive me to my first national rainbow gathering. Don't think culture is something you buy in a box or watch on television. It's actually the ceremonies that you and your tribe create. Jump out of the box and start creating your own culture. <laughs> In 1985, Robert M. Stutman was put in charge of the DEA's largest office in New York City. He put together a team of agents that led the fight against the crack epidemic. His best-selling book, Dead on Delivery, was made into a made-for-TV movie. He is a consultant to CBS News and has been called the most famous narc in America. In 1988, Stephen Hager was put in charge of High Times Magazine, the leading counterculture publication in America. 
His book, Hip Hop, had just been published, the first history of rap, graffiti, and breaking. His research was turned into the film, Beat Street. While at High Times, Hager created the Cannabis Cup and the Counterculture Hall of Fame. He has been called the most famous pothead in America. Now they meet in person. Hager versus Stutman. The head versus the Fed. <laughs>